She's the pushy broad from the Bronx, New York. Follow her voice, a straight dog is nice. She's the pushy broad from the Bronx, oh yeah. Don't be surprised if you want to listen twice. Make decisions, find the right choice. Know yourself better, find your own voice. It's okay if you need help today, cause everybody needs a little push. <laughs> from the pushy broad from the Bronx, New York. Welcome Transformation Talk Radio listeners. My name is Ellen Stewart and I am the pushy broad from the Bronx. Welcome to my brand new show, Women Who Push For More. This is where I interview enterprising and inspiring women who talk to us about how they are true pushy broads, women who push for more. I'm delighted to have with me today a very good friend of mine who actually also has my last name, even though we are not related. <laughs> this gal's name is Sarah Stewart. Sarah has a master's in social work. She is also a certified professional coach. She's also the owner of Sarah Stewart Consulting. She spent 25 years in healthcare, but then she made the leap and opened up her own business, Sarah Stewart Consulting. She mostly works with women, helping them to achieve their goals and make changes in their lives. And Sarah is the, o- the author of three books with a fourth along the way. Mm-hmm. She is here with us today to talk about how she has pushed for more. So Transformation Talk Radio listeners, welcome Sarah Stewart. Hi, Ellen. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. This is a great show. I love what you're doing. Thank you so much. We're really interested in talking to you. So tell us first, you started in mental health 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mm where'd you graduate? Uh, Where or when? Oh, where? I graduated with my MSW from the University of New England in 1995. And decided that you wanted to do what in mental health? So I decided that I actually wanted to work with adolescents. And I worked on a uh, locked psychiatric unit in a 65-bed psych hospital. That's where I did my intern. The day my intern ended, they hired me. And I was with that hospital for 10 years. Um, Doing different roles, though. I I kind of morphed into a director um, of an outpatient, uh, the outpatient department, and then I went on to be the director of marketing for the psych hospital. So you went from the clinical aspect of it to the business development and the sales aspect. Correct. Correct. What made you make that shift? Um, I don't know if I consciously made that shift or if I was selected to make that shift. Um, it, it, was, it was really my bosses who said, look, y- you do this really, really well. Um, we're going to give you some on-the-job training. And I took over the department. So what is it that they thought you did really, really well? I think they would see me at events and stuff. And you know, you're selling a new program. I mean, everybody thinks that hospitals don't need to sell, but they need to sell. There's a lot of competition, especially where I was. There was about five hospitals in close radius. um, And I worked for a for-profit hospital. And so you did, you were constantly marketing and selling new physician services and that sort of thing. And I think, you know, the higher ups just kind of watch me get out there and just really shake hands and kiss babies and without fear. So, um, so they saw that in me and, you know, I could write and I could write copy because you used to have a lot of brochures and stuff like that. And so, um, yeah, they just kind of said, hey, will you do this? And so, you know, you never, you never decline a promotion. <laughs> That's true. You do. You know? But I have been talking to so many women on, for women who push for more. And there are some general themes in terms of the kind of women that move through business and seek opportunities. Mm-hmm. You started doing one thing mm-hmm. and then other opportunities were presented to you to kind mm-hmm. of morph into and to reinvent yourself. Would you say that was the case? Oh, you seized an opportunity? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and it was scary because I, I was 28, 
You know, I, I was young. I was the youngest director in the hospital and it was like, okay, uh, I hope I can do this. <laughs> and I reached out for a lot of support and anytime somebody gave me advice or suggested something, I really kind of took it and ran with it. And, you know, I thought about it and was like, okay, yes, this, this is the right direction to go to. And I relied on a lot of female mentors that I had in my life. Um, Let's talk about that. You mentioned something about that, having strong female mentors. Give me an idea of what you're talking about. So even when I was an undergraduate, I, I was in social work and I had to do an internship and my intern supervisor was a woman, Manette. She was fabulous. And she, um, she took a risk with me. And that's what I saw a couple of my mentors do. I was um, working in a school and I was also working as a therapist in a county jail. Um, and they allowed me at 21 years old to go into this mostly male uh, county jail and start doing um, GED tutoring and then finally counseling. And so that was a real risk she took on me, especially at that age in that environment. And so I recognized that and she was honest with me about it, you know, that I'm, I'm, I'm hesitant, but I'm going to do this. And so for me, that let me know that I had to be, I, I had to prove her right. You know, I wasn't going to let her down. I really had to take this opportunity, right. make the most of it and gain her confidence. And then, you know, just keep going. And the same thing happened when I was in graduate school and I did get this internship at a psych hospital. The amazing clinician who ran the department said, you know, I'm taking a risk because you're the youngest person I've ever taken into this program. So again, I was, I was 24 and working in a psych hospital where you see some stuff that not everybody's ready to see, um, but she took that risk. So I was going to work my butt off to prove her right. That's also very interesting because when you are recommended by somebody or somebody says, I have faith in you, mm -hmm. I will give you a chance. Somebody who's pushing for more turns around and says, I'm not going to let you down. I am going to prove you right yes. rather than prove you wrong. Right, right. And I'm going to, I don't care how tired I am. <laughs> I don't care if I have to work 12 hour days and not get paid, which you don't with an intern. Um, you actually are paying for it because you get the college credit. <laughs> but you're just going to show up every day and work harder than anybody else in that department. Um, to, to prove them right. And that's what gets you the next opportunity. People see that. People see your tenacity and your hard work and wow, you know. And so you've got to, and, you know, what is luck, right? The, the crossroads between opportunity and hard work. So that's what you got to do. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. So you're making those opportunities. And then you talk about the fact that, that, um, that you really are seizing the next opportunity. And that's also something that happens with the pushy broad that you actually recognize the next plateau in your life, the next step up in your life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Many women just go along and say, okay, I'm going to do this and do this and do this. And they're not looking around. Mm -hmm. They're what I call one dimensional individuals, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. women who push for more and strive for more, like you said, will take us to our next opportunity. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. you'll know what it is and actually take that leap. Right. And I, and you know, that's interesting that you say that too, Ellen, because <clears throat> excuse me, I was with the hospital for, for 10 years, you know, so very early on in my career, then I'm, I'm all of a sudden 34. And I looked at my CEO, um, who is a man. And I said to him, I said, Bill, I said, my entire resume is for you. I've worked for you for 10 years. And he said, just the way I like it. You know, I said, but I need to change because if I don't change, I'm going to be a lifer. Like it was that moment where it's like, okay, you've been here, you've got credit, you know, you've got experience, you've got 10 years, but if you stay too long, you're just gonna have to stay there. Um, and it's scary because it's the only thing you know, really, uh, but I, I had to do it. That differentiates us from other women. Mm -hmm. Pushy broads are one who say, I'm ready for the next step. Correct. I've taken everything I can here. I've learned everything I need to do, but I need more in a good way. I know I'm meant for other things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did that come to you when you were young? Tell us a little bit about your childhood. 
Well, my childhood was, was interesting. I think I went through something that is, was unique um, to, for a lot of people. Um, when I was uh, about nine years old, my, my father was actually wanted by the FBI. And he went on the run <laughs> for about two weeks. Then he turned himself in um, and he actually ended up going to prison for, he was sentenced for 11 to 16 years, um, federal prison for embezzlement. So from the time I had just turned 13 until I was in college, my dad was in prison. And um, we went from a very comfortable life to one where we moved into my grandparents' house and my mom worked two jobs. So I saw her step up in a way that was amazing and not easy, but I think she was my first real role model of you're going to push through it with a smile and you're going to do it. Was your mother aware of what was happening with your father? Or was she in the dark? She was in the dark. <laughs> she was in the dark until, you know, it was all over the newspapers. And, you know, and you had, um, you know, it was 80. You had uh, all the camera crews and everything at the end of your driveway. So, you know, and it, it was one of those things too, where I was young enough, but old enough to understand what was going on. And I remember one time walking down to the teacher's room and I heard them talking about it. I was probably about 10 or 11. And I was like, you know, I never want anybody to feel sorry for me. Cause they were saying they feel badly, you know, for the kids. And I was like, I, I never want somebody to say that about me. So you have siblings. Yes. I have an older brother. Mm -hmm. So the two of you went through that. Yeah. So when did your dad get out of prison? I was a freshman in college. Yep. And, and then all right, and mom, mom and dad got back together for a brief time for a brief time. Yep. But then, um, I think I had the ultimate gift in a way. Um, my now stepbrother and I were very good friends in college and we were both raised by single parents and we introduced our parents and they've been married for 28 years. <laughs> wow. 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 What a story. around. Yeah. That. So, so but, we played a little wow, Cupid. <laughs> wow. So you're right. Your mom was a very, very strong role model. Here she Amazing. was in a situation where the mm -hmm. FBI is taking her husband away. She has two small children mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and now she has to handle it on her own. So she mm -hmm. moved in with her mom and dad and, uh, she, we oh, moved into like one of their homes. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and she, she worked two jobs and she always had a smile on her face and she, you know, we had a lot of fun and you know, we'd make the trip. My dad was in, um, in Lake Placid. So we would make the trip a couple of times a year to see him. But, um, you know, we had a, bl I had a great childhood. <laughs> That's wonderful. And it's a, it really a lot says a lot. Yeah. 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 And it so does. when you have your mother as that kind of an example, you know, you got, you got to send someone special to. Absolutely. Ask and you. certainly <laughs> learning, certainly, like you said, to be resilient, mm -hmm. to be fierce, to be yeah. proud, mm -hmm. um, to take responsibility. Yes. Oh, yeah. All of those All things of that, that All mom of that. did mm -hmm. and turn around and say, oh, I don't want anybody feel, to feel sorry for no. me. There's no reason no. for anybody to do that. No, I didn't do anything. <laughs> That's a, that's a powerful, powerful yeah. story. Mm -hmm. powerful. So, all right. So let's continue on. So here you are moving along mm -hmm. um, through uh, a job that you spent 10 years on and you turned around and said, mm -hmm. okay, it's time for me to move forward. Mm -hmm. What happens then? So actually this was um, funny. I, I, I went through a divorce at 34. And so, you know, whenever you're going through a, a divorce, your head is totally clear. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're being sarcastic. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I made the decision to move across the country to Los Angeles, where I knew three people, and start a consulting, an educational consulting company. So we would work with children who were struggling and needed to go to a therapeutic boarding school or wilderness program and things like that. So um, that was one of the best things I think I ever did. It was scary. It was crazy. Um, but I learned so much and the confidence that I got by building a business where I really didn't know anybody. I had, I was making 50 cold calls a day to clinicians and, and figuring out 
a city I didn't know, <laughs> a big city I didn't know. Um, and just navigating all of that, um, I could have very comfortably done it in New Hampshire where I knew every single therapist between Massachusetts, Maine and, and New Hampshire, um, but I didn't. And so it was a struggle. It was hard. Um, I remember getting our first client and just being over the moon and having the days where the phone didn't ring and just wondering, oh my God, you know, are we going to be able to pay the bills this, this month? So, um, but it, it, it was in doing that, I realized that you can pretty much put me anywhere and I'm going to figure it out. So what would you say to someone either, you know, whether young or, or older about, first of all, considering moving to mm -hmm. a different state or certainly cross country, what, mm -hmm. what should they be thinking about? What, what kind of confidence can you instill? And second of all, uh, maybe a young entrepreneur, give us some of the lessons mm -hmm. for them. Well, I think, you know, if you're considering moving somewhere, you really do need to get a sense of is this city or area in line with you? You know, because there, there are certain, and, and Ellen, you know this, we both have traveled all over this country pretty extensively and different cultures in different parts of, the, of uh, this country and, and can you live there full time? You know, um, not everywhere in this country are, are I don't know, not everybody gets all the same opportunity in different parts of this country. And so mm -hmm. I really think being in line with who you are is, is important. Um, if you're very much a liberal person, you might have a harder time in, you know, a more conservative area. So, so things like that, I think are important to consider, but, and, and obviously expense, do you have the money? Do you have, you know, a little bit of a cushion? I think that's really important. And if you want to make that move, then start saving right now that's your goal give yourself because if you have some breathing room it's going to be a little less stressful um, especially as you look if you don't have a job right away and for anybody who is thinking to start their own business um get ready to work <laughs> it is not <laughs> for the faint of heart that's for sure um, and again, I think if you're starting your own business, you know, whatever you think you need to start, double it. Whatever cash you think you need, right? Double it. Double oh it. Oh my God, yes. People say to me, you have the easiest job in the world to get to talk <laughs> on the radio. Okay, right. Sure. Nothing. That's all I do is talk on the radio. Right. That's, that's all it. you do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And, you know, get ready to learn a little bit about a lot of things too, you know, because you're going to have to be a, a master because you're not necessarily going to be afford to, um, you know, farm it out or have consultants, you know, so you're going to have to learn to build a web. A, a lot of younger people probably already do, but even if you're older and, you know, you're going to have to learn how to build a website and there's lots of YouTube is great for that, you know, how to do these things. Um, but yeah, get ready to get your hands dirty and do a lot of stuff and work very long hours. And work constantly, seven constantly. days a week, 24-7. Yeah, it's okay. Like us. What day is this, Ellen? Oh, working know. on a set. <laughs> I know. Oh, my goodness. Okay, so here you are in your 30s, one divorce mm -hmm. under your belt, and in, in Los Angeles as mm -hmm. an entrepreneur in a consulting firm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that goes on for about how long? About two years. And then what? And then I, a friend of mine actually let me know about a job with Karen Treatment Centers. Karen Treatment Centers, for those of you that don't know, is a mm -hmm. residential treatment center in Pennsylvania and in Florida, where, mm -hmm. and their, um, their rehabilitation centers actually help people suffering from alcohol and substance abuse. Right. And that's what you're talking about, karen.org. Yeah. Um, and actually, I did something on... My last show, Recovery Recharged, um, and if you want information about it, go to Karen, C-A-R-O-N dot org. So what year was that? So that was uh, 07, I think, 2007, um, the end of 2007. And actually, a funny story about that is um, I applied for the job. I was in Arizona doing a conference, and... David Rosenker, who was interviewing, was in Arizona too. So he met me at the conference, interviewed me. He said, well, you know, we're already 
narrowed it down to a couple people. So you've got one week to do this huge business plan and get it to me. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so I did, I flew home to Boston and I, I, I did it. And, um, then I was getting on a plane. I was going to the airport at five in the morning, get on the plane and I got a flat tire. I missed my flight for my in-person interview at Karen Treatment Centers. So I emailed my presentation to David. He did the slides and we didn't really have Zoom then either, you know? So I was on the phone pacing in my little 500 square foot apartment in the city and doing it over the phone. Um, and remarkably, they gave me the job. <laughs> but I wanted to break down. I wanted to, I just was overwhelmed, but we did it. We figured it out, you know? And that's the other thing you do. You figure it out. You don't quit. And, and if you're an entrepreneur, you're going to have to figure a lot of stuff out. You know, you just, you make it work. And that's one thing that we talk about as life coaches, because I know mm -hmm. you do what I do in terms of empowering women and empowering people to move forward. Mm -hmm. We get hit with a lot of things and a lot of curveballs, right? Like mm -hmm. you said, a flat tire on your way to an extremely important interview. Yeah. It depends upon how resourceful you are, and it also depends upon where you put your feelings and how you move past them. Mm -hmm. One of the things we say when I talk about recovery coaching is that feelings are not facts. You have to put your feelings aside. You can be upset, and, and, mm -hmm. and you could be um, screaming and yelling in your head and crying in your head, but you have to move forward. You have to de-escalate the crisis, and you have to continue on, and that's mm -hmm. what happens with a woman who pushes for more you can mm -hmm. kind of break down later or put your feelings um, mm -hmm. you got to compartmentalize yes yes and you got to do that in business whether you're working for yourself or somebody else you know th there'll be times where somebody comes in and is going to give you some really tough feedback um critic you're going to be able to handle it you're not going to like it <laughs> but you got to move on and you've got to you know, with your point, Ellen, about feelings, you've got to not let that get in the way of you improving yourself by accepting that feedback and really taking it and moving on, you know, because um, we can want to reject that right away. Exactly. It is how you accept and handle criticism mm -hmm. and look at it as awareness and how I can improve things and look at it from a point of view that will allow me to, to take that constructive criticism mm -hmm. and take mm -hmm. those ideas and um, redevelop them and, and make something really successful mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. So here you are from LA, you get the job here yeah. in, um, on the East Coast. So now mm -hmm. you're back on your home coast. Yes. Back up here in, in Boston. Mm -hmm. And um, what happens? How long are you with Karen? I was with Karen for two years. Um, and then I went to, I followed my boss basically. And I went to Foundations Recovery Network, um, which is now a different, it, with UHS, I think, but FRN. But um, I, I went there and that was wonderful, except I was on the East Coast. I had the whole East Coast and the treatment centers were in Memphis. The headquarters was in Brentwood, Tennessee. The other treatment center was in Malibu and the other in Palm Springs. So, <laughs> so I was on a plane all of the time. I was constantly on a plane. And that, Ellen, is actually when I first started to really dabble in writing because when you're at your fifth Marriott courtyard for the week <laughs> and you're really caught up with all of your Salesforce or whatever CRM you're using, uh, you're sick of watching reruns. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's when I would, would really kind of take the time to start exploring writing. So what made you decide that you wanted to write? Where did that come from? Um, I think I've always kind of had that. I, I've always liked creative writing and journaling and stuff like that. My whole life, I've liked to write um, and I can do it pretty quickly. Um, but I also, as I'm traveling, you're seeing all sorts of stuff. You know, you're seeing stuff all over the country. You're seeing interactions with people. You're seeing, you know, you're in some of the best restaurants, fortunately, and you're in some of the scariest little, like, <laughs> you know, back alleys, you know, to, to try and figure out where this office is, you know? So, so you just really get to experience all sorts of different people and cultures, and that just gets your mind going. Uh, it gets my mind going. And so, um, 
I just started to see stories in, in where I was. And so I would start to write and, and, you know, you just kind of piece it like everything else. You just one, one step at a time, one word at a time. So that was in what year that you started to write stories, started to think about piecing them together? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, nine. In 09. Mm -hmm. So you started to amass and started to mm -hmm. create some fiction, right? It's mm -hmm. fiction that you write. I get to make stuff up for a living. Isn't that great? <laughs> It's a wonderful thing. It really is. So here you are out of the world of behavioral health and mm -hmm. mental health, um, mm -hmm. navigating your way from being a clinician to someone that work, is working in sales and mm -hmm. business development, mm -hmm. moving from one coast to the other, doing mm -hmm. private consulting, helping people coach to empower their dreams and to move them forward in their goals. Mm -hmm. And then you find on top of this, that there's a creative side to you that you mm -hmm. want to express and nurture. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So here you are in 2009, writing mm -hmm. some stuff down and putting mm -hmm. stuff together. Mm -hmm. And then your first book mm -hmm. comes out in May of 2015 called mm -hmm. Broken in the Back Bay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How did it feel to have your first book published? Oh, so exciting. <laughs> it really was. It really was. You know, it, it's funny. Everything you do to achieve any it is anything you do and achieve is a lot of hard work behind it. Um, but this was years in the making for me. Um, and I, I kind of between 09 and publishing in 2015, I had like two solid book ideas going. Um, and I had to do a total rewrite of broken in the back bay. Um, and not only that, I went from a complete high, which is often in business, to a complete low where I threw the book across the room <laughs> because even though I paid for content um, and grammatical uh, editing, I, I found, I opened the book and found like instantly like four or five errors. And I just was so frustrated after it was published, you know? So expect some highs and lows. <laughs> But oh after I goodness. did that, I figured out how to get it fixed, you know, and so in, in the least expensive way. And I went through the whole book again, line by line, circling everything, and then making those edits and re-uploading the entire book. Wow. <laughs> okay. So first of all, give us a little synopsis, a little taste of what Broken in the Back Bay actually is about. So Broken in the Back Bay actually follows the lives of um, four women. And so the, the subtitle is, um, are they broken lives or is it the perfect crime? So they get together because they're all are successful, but they all are struggling with one thing or another. And their therapist brings them together to do group therapy. So that's their total strangers and they come together. But meanwhile, um, this crime is unraveling and it links them all together in a way they never knew. So there's a twist to it. All of my books, I will say, have a twist at the end. So they kind of keep you going. <laughs> Unbelievable. So now I have to ask, mm -hmm. with these women in, in treatment uh, based on any, any real people that you dealt with? Um, I think it's, they're a mishmash of people, you know? Um, and obviously I know a little bit <laughs> about mental health issues and, and, and things that people would be struggling with. So, so you know, yes, I, I, I've definitely pulled some of that, but it's not actually like one person. Um, that that i know um but yeah so but it was it's it's fun it's that's it's fantastic a fun story. and yeah. people can find broken in the back bay on amazon correct yep 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 paperback or um you know kindle ebook and mm -hmm. very shortly after that in 2016 you came out with strangers on newberry street yes. was yes. that the second book that was practically yes. in the yes. works again yes. Tell yeah. us a little bit about that. So Strangers on Newberry Street um, follows this girl named Lexi, who is going through a complete career change. Um, so she is leaving a lucrative career that she has built on her own, and she is starting a little boutique chocolate shop on Newberry Street. And so while she's doing this, um, her life is very chaotic. She's got some friends. She's dating. You're kind of following her dating life, too. And... Um, 
she, but she's getting this creepy constant feeling like somebody's watching her, somebody's following her. And as the story unfolds, you realize that she has a reason to be concerned because of events that had happened to her uh, years prior. So, so you get this, this kind of, <clears throat> you're following her, trying to succeed, but also not lose it because she really thinks somebody's following her. And, um, and then again, total twist at the end. Wow. So <laughs> kind of like you, you, you have this Agatha Christie-esque situation yeah. here going on with both of the books. Yes. That's amazing. Also available on Amazon as well. Yes. yes. And then you took a little time off. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And three years later, in April of 2019, came out with your third book, Love Along the Esplanade. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Tell us about that. So Love Along the Esplanade is a little bit different. It is a very, very um, family friendly, shall I say? <laughs> you know, no real dark darkness or anything like that. Um, but it is fun. I, I had a lot of fun writing this book. Um, and this book is about a woman who is a relationship coach. Um, and it pits her against a romance novelist because this woman, this relationship coach, she finds romance novels are fake and they derail her clients because they believe in this like, you know, prince on a white horse coming in. So she thinks it's all BS. But this romance novelist, he's very successful. Nobody knows his, his or her identity. And so a very successful blog run by a young man who's probably like 20, throws up this contest and says, 50 grand for whoever can reveal uh, this romance novelist's identity. And so you watch these two things come together and they overlap and all the press and drama gets kind of entangled. And um, you're just trying to figure out who this romance novelist is. <laughs> so it's a lot of fun. And at the end, um, oh, and meanwhile, too, she's uh, launching her first uh, self-help book. So, so that's how she's getting in with with all this but it, it, it's a lot of fun she she you know has a great romance in there too so so it's 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 good fantastic so mm -hmm. any of that based in the real life of sarah stewart no <laughs> wow so do you fall into the category where you feel where you mm -hmm. you feel that that the romance and all of that stuff holds some truth or or do you feel more like like the author or like the therapist who is a relationship coach where do you fall I, you know that's interesting i i think both um i mean look we all want that escape right? We all want, uh, however you escape, you know, and if, if romance novels are your escape, then that's fun. But I think, and I have seen this in practice, when people really start to integrate that into their reality, and that's what they want, and their expectations of a romance are through the roof that nobody can live up to, that's where it can get, you know, dangerous. But, um, you know, if you, can, if you can separate the two and just have fun with it, um, you know, if you can watch the Kardashians and not think you're one of them, then great. <laughs> <laughs> Where you can watch the Hallmark Channel and not think this is how your life is going to be forever and ever. Then and nobody ever fights and it gets resolved really Yes, nicely. And, and the moment you meet your Mr. Right, everybody knows it. The whole town right. knows it. And, and not only that, but everybody that's single finds somebody, no matter what their age is, and no matter where they are, they're finding the love of their life all in a very small town where everybody just wants to be close to home and right. in suburbia. Right, yes. right, right, right. <laughs> yes, yes. That's a little much, right? Yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> but a little no, not based in reality. Fantastically creative. That's marvelous. You've got three outstanding ideas for wonderful books. Let's Thank take, let's, let's just go back a little bit mm. about writing and publishing books. Mm -hmm. and let's talk. There are so many young young people out there that are exercising some of their creative talent mm -hmm. and many of them are graduating school with creative writing degrees mm -hmm. and are thinking about their first novel. Um, even I am now thinking about my first novel publishing as Pushy Broad for the Bronx and the Yay! whole thing. But, but, but something that, that is, not, uh, is not so Agatha Christie-esque or, or, or Daniel Steele remnant. Yeah. Yeah. Something a little bit more concrete in terms of self-help. Uh, but nevertheless, publishing a book takes mm -hmm. a great deal of courage and, and mm -hmm. time and effort. 
let us know what you went through and, and how you overcame certain things and what your advice would be to budding authors today. Yeah. Um, well, it's funny, actually, because a friend of mine who's a psychologist on the, the West Coast, he's published quite a few um, books that are nonfiction. And we were having lunch and he was like, oh, you're writing fiction? That's so personal. And I... <gasps> I kind of freaked out. I was like, what do you mean? You, 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 you wrote a very personal nonfiction um, book. But I, I get what he's saying because when you're writing fiction and, and really any book, but when you're writing fiction, people are reflecting your work onto you. Like, like you just asked me, Ellen, like how much of you is in some of the, in any of these characters and stuff. And of course there are elements of the author is going to come out. Um, or, or if you're like a Stephen King and you're writing like really creepy novels, you know, what's the world going to think of you, <laughs> who you actually are. So that, um, is scary and it's scary to create something that you spend so much time working on because if you're writing 80,000 words, you know, if your book is 80,000 words, you wrote 125, right? Uh, because of all the edits and everything like that. So you just think about that enormity of that task and, and how much time it does take. And then you're just putting it out to the world to judge the whole world, not just your boss, not just a couple people in a boardroom, everybody. <laughs> and I mean, that was scary for me at first. Um, but I think the accomplishment and the fact that I did it uh, outweighed any fear of publishing. You know, it's like, you know what, whatever, judge me away. I did this. You didn't see it. <laughs> exactly. You, you have know? something tangible to show for mm -hmm. it. I mean, you not only wrote one book, but you have written three. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like you said, um, you did it. And I know that you've spoken about the fact that most people don't achieve their goals because of the fear. Yes. Yeah. Right. Let's talk yes. about that a little bit. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, I, I wrote a blog once about um, the two F's and two R's of, of not achieving your new year's resolution. Um, meaning, you know, people are fear, feel, uh, fearful of failure, rejection, and then resentment. Right. So I'm afraid I'm going to fail. So I don't try it or I, or I, get, you know, sidetracked or I get, take a couple steps back. So it feels like I'm failing. I, I'm, I'm afraid of rejection. Um, and trust me, if you want to be a writer, get used to it, <laughs> get used to it. Um, and then resentment, you know, when you do get rejected more than once, or somebody writes a, you know, a critical thing about your work or whatever, then you hold on to that resentment and you just stay stuck. And so I really feel like those things, as any entrepreneur or any woman even just coming into business, you really need to take a look at those things. And anytime something happens, okay, is, is this me being afraid to fail? Am I not moving forward because I'm afraid to fail? I'm afraid to be rejected. Or am I holding on to some resentment that isn't serving me any purpose? Um, and it's just holding me back. And I, and I think that's, that's really important. I mean, who was it? I don't know. Stephen King got rejected a lot, I think maybe 27 times or something. Yes, look at J.K. Rowling, who wrote in her car and got rejected like crazy. And right. She it was on welfare. Matter. Exactly. Was on exactly. Welfare. Yes. I mean, really yes. and truly and was rejected by some of the biggest names in, in the industry and still persisted. Correct. Um, women who push for more understand that that inner strength comes from them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have to believe in yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And stop worrying about what the world believes. Right. I've right. always told my listeners and my clients that every single no leads you closer to a yes. Uh, absolutely, Ellen. That is, that is so true. Yep. A hundred percent. And, but you know, like, like you, I know you to be a very, very strong woman. Um, and it does take courage and, but you have to encourage yourself. Um, and you have to also then become fearless because just because you wrote the book, doesn't mean anybody's going to read it. <laughs> you then have to go into sales mode and you actually are in sales mode six months before you publish the book. And, and I think that's really important, especially for a young person who's, who's maybe really hasn't had any time in promotion or marketing. It's just really kind of been focused on journalism or, or creating. Know this, know that even if you have a publisher, you still have to market. 
you have to always be selling yourself and not be afraid to push your stuff. Because if you want to, you want to make money, got to push it. <laughs> that's exactly right. And people mm -hmm. don't realize it with all the creative stuff that's going mm -hmm. on and everything that you do and everything that you consider to be your talent, whatever mm -hmm. that is for mm -hmm. a woman, if it's creative writing or if it's um, doing something that gives you pleasure or being an entrepreneur or um, if you're a painter, an artist, a sculptor, um, any of those things yep. and you want to move forward, you still have to constantly believe enough in yourself to sell yourself to the Correct. world. Correct. Correct. Because nobody is going to sell you yep. like you. Right. Right. And in order to do that, we have to be pushy broads. Right. Right. Because it's hard. It's hard to sell yourself. I think that's what, you know, give me a widget. I'll sell it all day. <laughs> But when you are selling yourself, that's one of the hardest things to do. Selling yourself is the hardest thing in the world. Mm -hmm. And you're right. When we sell ourselves, we come off like pushy broads. Correct. Yeah. Okay. It's good for us. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. Good for us. I want you to know that I am on a mission and I'm gathering everybody, but I am on a mission to change the urban dictionary definition of pushy broad, which is so, I'm not kidding, which is so negative yeah. and so demeaning to us that I am actually forming a group. And I know that you will join it with me to sign petitions, to mm -hmm. change the dictionary, the urban dictionary def definition mm -hmm. of pushy broad, which is in its negative con con you know, connotation. Um, somebody that is um, outspoken and really egregious in every aspect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I just think that is, um, completely unfair. And yeah. I, and I tell everybody that outspoken just simply means the dictionary definition of outspoken means to speak out, to speak out. And you know, Ellen, I, I have to say we lost one of the pushiest broads ever last night with Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Right. I mean, there you go here, here, rest in peace and in power that she was. I mean, she pushed through every boundary, every barrier and, just achieved so much and did so much for women. And, and I mean, again, we lost a great warrior. We sure did. And the world looked up to her. Yes. She was an absolute icon. She yes. is still an icon and she is certainly the original <laughs> pushy broad from Brooklyn because that's who she was, she the original pushy broad. So absolutely. Thank you so much for mentioning that. What an yeah. amazing salute to um to ruth bader ginsburg and you're absolutely right mm -hmm. and um for that reason alone um was one of the reasons why i will why i will continue yes. to be pushy broad from the bronx and continue to do this women who push who push yes. for more i love I it really important really yes. really important it is so it is. here you are so mm -hmm. now i know you're working on a fourth book so can yes. you talk about that um yes this fourth book is is um a, a little different um in the fact that um there is a actually a, a female attorney who a young female you know i say young in her like mid 30s who is um runs you know like free legal aid for people who are getting divorced, domestic violence, all of that in you know, an inner city um, area. And she has an incredibly famous father who is dying and he is a drunk and a womanizer. And you're, you're, as her life is unfolding, an interview, a last interview with this gentleman who, who is her father kind of unfolds. And she, and she really has disdain for him because he left when she was very young. But then you, you're going to kind of find out the real story in his final book, which is a tribute to his daughter. So it's, it's going to be heartfelt. There's going to be some pain. Um, but in the end, I think it'll be a lot of fun. Uh, Fantastic. Yeah. The, the name of the new book, you have a title? Uh, AJ Winston is dead. And the projected <laughs> release date? Uh, no, I, I don't have that yet. I, 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 you know, I should put pressure on myself being a pushy broad. <laughs> but I don't know if I can put that much pressure on myself. I, I'm hoping for spring. I, I'm, I am hoping for shooting for spring of um, 2021. 
Fantastic. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. a tremendous accomplishment. That's Thank really Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah. Really good. Yeah, All thanks. Right. So let's talk a little bit about your work with women. Um, you mm-hmm. are a uh, life uh, achievement coach, mm-hmm. and you are also a um, yeah a life achievement coach. Let's talk about that. How come mm-hmm. you call yourself a life achievement coach? Tell us about that. Uh, because that's what I want. You know, I, I'm I'm a therapist by trade. I, I've spent years working with people on their why, why did this happen? Why did that happen? You know, which can drive everybody crazy. Um, I, I want to focus on what do you want to do and how we're going to get there. Let's achieve. That's what I want. And I think, and Ellen, I, you know, you're a coach as well, and you, you, you have a thriving practice. You know, one of the things about any goal for people is they usually have an idea of where they want to start, They usually have an idea of what the end is going to look like, but that middle is so hard. And that is like I've said to you, you know, that's where the grind and the work and the tenacity really come in. And that's where I think coaching can really help people is you can help people kind of figure out where you want to go, but you can also help people when they get stuck. And I got coached to get through a part of, uh, I got stuck writing. I kind of got into a writer's block and I reached out to a coach and it was fabulous and it wasn't long-term. But it really kind of helped me just focus my energy on where it needed to be. And and it got me through, um, and that was with my first book. So so I I understand the power of coaching, um, having been a client and I, I just think it can be so powerful for people just to give them that extra whatever they need. Or if they're feeling overwhelmed, um, because whenever you're starting a business or doing something, it can be very overwhelming, all all the balls in the air, you know, and we can really just kind of help you organize your thoughts, your brains, your, your tasks. And I, and I think that that can be, especially like, you know, now I've got a lot of moms who are professionals who are, have their kids at home, homeschooling. And, you know, it's just like, (laughs) They're amazing. They're amazing. I understand. I listen. You talked about a few things, and they certainly Ooh. resonated with me. I know that you've you've probably done a lot of work, and I have um, doing various self development situations. And I got mm-hmm. to the point where I was studying my why. You know, why do I do this? Why do mm-hmm. I do this? And mm-hmm. I'm sitting here, and in front of me always is my why is to educate, empower, and inspire mm-hmm. hope in people so that they realize they are not stuck and that change is possible. Right, right. Nobody is stuck. No, Nobody coaching. Is stuck. Right. There are always options. And I right. always wanted to be a coach because I understood that, number one, you're not stuck. Number two, just like you, I want to take people from where they are now and push them forward. Okay, Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. it's all about where you are now. And Mm -hmm. also knowing that short term goal focused solutions is what gets us there. Okay, move up the field in football 10 yards at a time. That's right. You get a first down and you get to go, you get to go further. You get to go again. (laughs) You get to go again. So if I can just get those 10 yards, then we'll get to go again. Okay, but you are not stuck. Okay, there's not a whole bunch of uh, uh, of, uh, of tacklers on top of you. You get that's, up. That's right. Get that's up. right. Close and you get up. Right. And, and, you know, I even said that to a friend of mine, I, I'm sure you know too, she's, she's a therapist and she's working on a book and she texted me and she's like, Sarah, I'm going to need your coaching, you know? And I was like, here's my coaching, butt and chair an hour a day. Like you just have to do it like a job. You know, you've got a big task of 80 or what, hundred thousand words every day, make it a habit. You know. That's exactly right. And if you'll see Pushy Broad from the Bronx, everything I say in my commercials and everything else says, my approach is part cheerleader, part drill sergeant. Get over that's it. That's right. <laughs> true. And that's true because we do have to play both of those roles. You know, I, I will cheer you on 100% and I will celebrate every, every accomplishment, but I'm also going to call you out where it, it needs to be called out. It's just, exactly. Otherwise, I'm a bad coach. Exactly. Exactly. And that's exactly what a coach does. So that's, mm-hmm. that's certainly part of it. So, um, and we will have all of your information. We'll have all your book information up so that people can see it and know where to find you and your consulting information here as well. So that if people want to reach out to you, <coughs> excuse me, they can. Mm-hmm. So um, give us some idea of some 
some parting words that you'd like to have for some of the young women out there in terms of what they should be doing now, especially since we are going through a tremendous upheaval, we are still trying to get over this pandemic and, mm -hmm, and moving mm -hmm. forward. In mm -hmm. terms of how do they move forward with their self-confidence in their life in a situation where we're kind of now uncertain? What advice do you have as a mm -hmm. life achievement coach? Um, I, I would say one of the things is don't ever stop being curious, <laughs> right? Because if you're curious, you're learning, you're researching, you're moving forward, you're bettering yourself. And even if you're stuck in a tiny little apartment, if you have, you know, YouTube and you're watching this, you can learn and you can be curious and you can, and you can start. And if, if you want to start a project, um, but you can't right now because of the pandemic or something, get all your ducks in a row. You can always do something to start moving towards your goal, even if it seems like, oh, that's the smallest thing. It won't, it won't matter. Trust me, it matters. <laughs> It matters. So get yourself organized, even, even writing a plan to what you're going to do when this is, when the pandemic's over. Um, but that, that gives you a sense of purpose. And anytime we have a sense of purpose, we have a reason to get up in the morning and we're excited about it. So, so, you know, if, if you're moving forward and giving yourself a sense of purpose, you're going to get through this and you're going to be on the other side, ready to roll. And that's a really good thing. And you don't have to look outside for a sense of purpose. Yes. Absolutely not. We are so much more fortunate now than maybe you were in writing your first book where you're sitting there with your little journal and you're writing, as opposed to, you know, you were looking around to find outside influences. Mm -hmm. We still have the world in front of us. We are Absolutely. extremely lucky that we have the world at our fingertips, that we can do all the research that we need. We can mm -hmm. be exposed to so many things and expand our mind so and, and no that's, matter yeah that's so important ellen because 20 years ago we would have really been having a hard time <laughs> yeah i mean it's spot on absolutely so being a pushy broad being mm -hmm. pushy is my acronym for powerful unafraid self-aware hard-working young at heart and then, of course, absolutely fabulous female. That is my definition of pushy broad. I so Sarah Stewart, mm -hmm. MS, MSW, CPC author, do you consider yourself a pushy broad? Heck yeah. <laughs> Proudly. <laughs> okay. So you are the pushy broad from New Hampshire, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so this is Sarah Stewart, a good friend of mine, an author out with three books that you can find, I'm sure, in local bookstores and on Amazon as well. Mm -hmm. Broken in the Back Bay, published May of 2015. Strangers on Newberry Street, published January 2016. And Love Along the Esplanade, published April of 2019. And a brand new book coming out in the spring, yeah, hopefully. 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 Yes, which is going to be a little mystery and a little drama and a little mm -hmm. romance, all of those things. Sarah Stewart, you can find her at Sarah Stewart Consulting. Thank you very much with, be, for being with us today on Women Who Push For More. Alan, thank you so much for the opportunity. I love everything you do, and this is just great for women. So thank you. Thank you. This is Ellen Stewart, the pushy broad from the Bronx, saying thanks for listening. And remember, everybody needs a little push. From the pushy broad from the Bronx, New York.